passage on this third Sunday of Advent is from the book of Matthew chapter 2. It's the entire chapter, Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 23. It is a doozy. Um, it's, <laughs> it's humorous to some degree, uh, maybe in a dark way that we're doing this during our special Christmas service. Uh, but I really think that the Lord is going to use it. This is, as I said, the third Sunday of Advent, a season in which we recount with wonder the events leading up to Christ's birth and then long with anticipation for Christ's return. Our Advent series this year is called Christ Over All because we're going to see what uh, Christ's past and future comings have to say about four things, fear, loneliness, injustice, and death, a summary of the difficulties we've been experiencing during 2020. We've already dealt um, with fear and loneliness, and so this morning we are dealing with injustice. Christ over injustice. So here's Matthew chapter 2, the whole chapter, verses 1 through 23. The passage will be up on the screen, but I'll also uh, read it as enthusiastically and passionately as possible. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came from Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, and the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. <clears throat> and he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had Seeing when it rose, went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. But when King Herod died. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother, and went over to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, <coughs> he was afraid to go there, and being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. Let's pray together. Lord, it is grace upon grace that you have given us space again to worship you, to hear from your word, to be formed by it, and by your grace changed. We do I trust that this difficult passage will in the end, challenge us and encourage us this Christmas season. It's not an easy passage to deal with, but it's important that we ta tackle it honestly. And so we uh, ask for your um, presence with us, the work of your Spirit, to equip us to illuminate this text. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Well, since this is the season for Christmas music, I thought it would be appropriate to begin our message this morning with a fun little Christmas ditty written sometime around the 14th century. I'll read the second and third stanzas, and I'll trust you'll enjoy it as much as I do. Here's, here's how it goes. I'm going to say it instead of sing it, otherwise you never listen again. Herod the king in his raging... Charged he hath this day his men of might in his own sight, all young children, to slay. That woe is me, poor child for thee, and ever morn and day, for they parting neither say nor sing, bye-bye, luli, lule. Okay, well, wait a minute here. These lyrics actually aren't at all enjoyable. In fact, they're entirely disturbing when you understand their full meaning. They come from... The Coventry Carol, which is a lullaby written from the perspective of mothers singing to children who are about to be murdered by Herod the Great under the circumstances we just read about in Matthew chapter 2. All of you are smart and sophisticated people, at least in my opinion, so I won't explain the reasons why you probably haven't heard this carol at your local Christmas pageant or on the radio. If you have heard it, it's probably because Pentatonix actually did cover this song on their 2016 Christmas album. Apparently, a cappella groups start getting all medieval on you uh, when they run out of songs to cover but need to keep pumping out the albums. With all due respect to Pentatonix, it is very tempting to follow the broader musical trends and skip past this so-called massacre of the innocents. I mean, this is, a, this is a total downer passage that actually introduces some serious theological difficulties, and it's at least PG-13, and on top of that, you can't really festoon this passage with garlands and put it on your Shutterfly Christmas card. But especially this year, in the midst of supercharged conversations about justice, we need to face this passage because it reminds us that Jesus was born among a people experiencing grave injustices. And not only that, his birth ultimately exacerbated the severity of the injustices experienced by families living in Bethlehem. So let's get after it and as we explore this passage, we'll see that it has something to say to those who are perpetrating injustice and those who are experiencing injustice, and I think to some degree those who wish to be just and pursue justice. Two reflections this morning. Number one, you too can be like Herod. You too can be like Herod. And then number two, God will fulfill his promises. You can be like Herod too. And then number two, God will fulfill his promises. Let's begin with that first reflection. You too can be just like Herod. Question, why was Herod, to quote the Coventry Carol, raging? Why was he raging? Short answer, at the time of Jesus' birth, Herod the Great was serving as essentially a kind of Roman-appointed king of Israel, so in a sense he was kind of the king of the Jews, you might say. He was therefore not especially tickled to hear, as you see in verse 2, that another so-called king of the Jews had been born, and that pagan, of all people, pagan wise men, probably from Babylon or, or Persia, were so intrigued by all of this that they were making a special trip to see this newly born king of the Jews. The thing about kings, and please excuse this generalization if you're a king and you're not like this, I apologize, but the thing about kings is that they're not so big on circumstances that might threaten their authority, especially the emergence of rival kings. Such circumstances can indeed cause a king to rage, and in their rage, kings tend to do anything necessary to eliminate perceived threats, even if doing so means employing ruthless tactics. 
Initially, King Herod tried to trick the pagan wise men into revealing Jesus' specific location. Look at verse 8. And he, that is Herod, sent them, that is the wise men, to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. But of course, Herod was, was never going to come and worship Jesus. He was going to come and kill Jesus. And by the way, this was absolutely nothing new for Herod. He had previously killed his own wives, sons, and others whenever he sensed that a plot might be underway to remove him from power. However, the Lord intervened, specifically by warning the wise men in a dream, verse 12, not to return to Herod and spill the beans. So Herod hatched plan B, which was a truly breathtaking act of injustice. Honestly, one of the worst acts of injustice in the entire Bible. He thought to himself, you see this in verse 16, you know what? Since I know the child is in Bethlehem, but the wise men never return to give me his specific address, I'll just kill all of the male children in Bethlehem who are around his age. Recall that the wise men had previously given Herod information about the timing of the star's appearance. So apparently Herod had enough information to estimate that Jesus was around one to two years old. Thus Herod's decision to go and kill all the male children two years old or under in the region of Bethlehem. How many children was this? The text doesn't give us a specific answer, a tally, but given the size of Bethlehem, this probably meant anywhere from 10 to 30 murders. Biblical justice, biblical justice, at least the kind we're talking about this morning, primarily refers to mutuality. This moral zeal to serve one another sacrificially and and generously showing special concern for the weak and the vulnerable. And naturally, that kind of mutuality ends up promoting human dignity and flourishing and equity in various spheres of life, economically, socially, and on and on you go. We talked about this a few months ago in the message we did on Amos chapter 5. You can go back and listen to that online. Conversely, injustice involves exploitation for personal gain. That's the opposite of mutuality. And it tends to have an especially adverse and marginalizing effect on the weak and the vulnerable. Herod's actions are therefore the archetypal example of biblical injustice. Look injustice up in the dictionary and you're going to find a picture of this. Instead of serving the subjects under his rule, Herod zealously pursued his own self-interest. And to do that, he exploited children of all people, toddlers, the most vulnerable people in his kingdom. And to do that, he committed murder, which is the ultimate kind of exploitation. And by the way, Herod's actions also help us understand the source of, or the cause of injustice in a uniquely memorable way. According to Christianity, according to Christianity, the source of injustice, the source or, or the cause of injustice is actually a misaligned relationship with God that involves coronating ourselves as the ultimate royal authority rather than submitting ourselves to God's royal authority, or we can put it like this, the cause of injustice involves being a King Herod. The cause of injustice involves being a King Herod whose earthly kingship became everything to him and compromised his relationship with the true king. He became his own God, he became his own sort of God, making zero room for the true God, even though he had previously claimed, believe it or not, a conversion to Judaism. Why is this 
misalignment the cause of injustice? Why is this kind of misalignment the cause of injustice? Because self-coronation inevitably involves using other people to serve your own interests, to serve your own comforts, and to maintain your seat on the so-called throne. Very importantly now, Christianity and secularism, and, and specifically atheistic secularism, therefore have an entirely different take on the primary cause of injustice. Christianity shows, it shows a vertical cause, a refusal to acknowledge and submit to God's authoritative kingship. Secularism generally argues for a horizontal cause. Certain people are inherently more unjust than others because of their identity, such as their race, their ethnicity, their socioeconomic status, their gender, and so forth. And accordingly, there's not really much you can do about it. If you fit the mold, you fit the mold. You're kind of a lost cause. And so we find that Christianity is therefore increasingly countercultural in the following two ways. Number one, it shows us that anyone, anybody, regardless of their identity, can be a King Herod and perpetrate injustice, however large or small. Why? Because anybody's vertical relationship with God can be misaligned and in fact will be unless God intervenes. But, number two, Christianity is actually far more hopeful than atheistic secularism. Anyone, even people who perpetrate the worst kinds of injustice, can experience forgiveness and redemption and change. Nobody is ultimately a lost cause. And how is that the case? How is that the case? It's the case on account of of the Jesus born in Bethlehem, whom the wise men so desperately wanted to see and Herod desperately wanted to kill. A Jesus who would ultimately go to the cross and get this, endure the consequences for our injustices and more broadly our sin, though he committed none himself. A Jesus who thereby made a way for us to repent our self-coronation and embrace the true king and become part of his kingdom forever. So Advent, as it turns out, is a simultaneously horrifying and hopeful season for Herod's. Jesus' birth and future return remind us that if we, if we don't repent, our sin will ultimately ravage us and, and destroy us. When King Herod was trying to kill Jesus, history records that he had actually developed a, a debilitating disease that eventually killed him shortly after all of this took place. And you know, that's exactly what sin is like. Herod's physical illness was actually an external illustration of what was happening in his soul. Sin is this, this ravaging disease that breaks us apart and ultimately destroys us. And not to pile on, but this needs to be said as well, death is also God's just judgment against those who perpetrate injustice. He does not turn a blind eye toward the deeds of the wicked, and their demise is ultimately well earned. So for the Herods out there who are passionately self-focused and, and happy as a clam, even in the face of the injustice that their self-interest causes, be warned and watch out. Be warned and watch out. And as we said earlier, anybody can be a Herod. No one is really immune. You certainly don't have to be a political leader to fall into the same kinds of traps that King Herod encountered. And acts of injustice are often, of course, far more subtle and hard to detect than murdering children. But, for those who are convicted and, 
and driven to repent and to believe there is so much hope for you this Advent season. In King Jesus, in King Jesus, you have forgiveness, you have redemption. And in King Jesus, you can also expect genuine change. Because here's the thing, when, when Jesus grabs a hold of us, he doesn't just save us spiritually, he actually reforms our desires. In fact, we become an entirely new creation. See 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and, and part of that involves, by definition, becoming a justice-loving people because God is a justice-loving God. And that's how great the power of God truly is. Herods don't just get saved, as important and significant as that is. Herods don't just get saved, they, they drop their Herodian ways and end up advocating for the kind of justice they used to passionately undermine. And in, in the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, how will such people correctly celebrate Christmas? This is how. By laying down all power, all honor, all reputation, all vanity, all arrogance, all individualism beside the manger by remaining lowly and letting God alone be high. That's how justice-loving people who are being changed by the power of God will celebrate Christmas. This is true Christmas worship, worship that glorifies God and inevitably spills over into the way we treat our neighbors. Now let's turn to the second reflection, which is a word more for those who are experiencing injustices. Those who are experiencing injustices. And here's a reflection. God will fulfill his promises. You will find some variant of the word fulfill everywhere in the book of Matthew, including three times here in Matthew chapter 2. Look at verse 15. Joseph and Mary's hasty journey to Egypt to flee Herod's murderous threats in Bethlehem was, quote, to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Verse 17, Herod's murderous rage in Bethlehem fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah concerning Rachel weeping for her children. And in verse 23, Jesus' journey from Egypt to Nazareth and Galilee fulfilled what the prophets had spoken, that he would be a Nazarene. This is a fascinating pattern, and we saw yet another example of this last week in which prophetic utterances that are found in the Hebrew Scriptures, although already realized to some degree in Israel's history, are more fully realized or fulfilled in Jesus. It's a fascinating pattern. For example, God did call his son Israel, and God used that term to refer to his people, the Israelites. He called his son Israel out of Egyptian slavery. But as we discussed last week, the Israelites continued to run into countless difficulties, often on account of their own sinful rebellion. They found themselves oppressed in exile and eventually oppressed underneath the heavy hand of the Romans. Should we therefore conclude that God did a mediocre job delivering and looking out for his people? No. In fact, down the road he was going to call yet another son out of Egypt. Once again, see verse 15. Namely, his son, Jesus. And this son wasn't just going to save God's people from some kind of geopolitical oppression. He was going to save them from their sins. So if you were an Israelite thinking to yourself, yeah, the prophets, the prophets have, have more or less been on target, but it seems like God was promising a bit more than we've heretofore experienced, you would have been exactly right. And then enter Jesus, the ultimate fulfillment of all of God's promises to his people. In church, that is a consideration that helps us come to terms 
for an otherwise almost unbearable passage. It doesn't answer all of our questions, but it helps us come to terms with an otherwise almost unbearable passage. Because, I mean, this, this passage is brutal. Mary and Joseph are literally fleeing for the life of their son. And even worse, that's nothing compared to the family still in Bethlehem who had to helplessly watch Herod's men murder their children. And even worse, worse, to some degree, it feels like God's plan kind of maximized the death toll here. No wonder (laughs) this wasn't in the preschool Christmas play. No wonder our our nativity sets, which already inaccurately depict the, you know, the wise men at the manger, don't also have some sort of, you know, King Herod figurine raging in the background. But instead of giving us a bunch of whys in response to all of this injustice, what we get from Matthew instead is dot connecting. We get reminders that despite all of this injustice, God is fulfilling all of his plans and promises to his people in spectacular fashion. And truthfully, these awful injustices are actually advancing God's plans. God's not just working around all of this injustice. He's working through it. How might this be helpful, even comforting, to people like mothers singing a lullaby to their doomed children? How might this be comforting to people in our country and around the world who are experiencing various kinds of injustices? I'm going to say three things. Although in this short amount of time, of course, we can't deal with all the nuances of this complicated topic. But I will say three things. Number one, this pattern of fulfillment that we see, that God fulfills all of his promises, it shows us that injustice is not the end of the story. It's not the end of the story. It won't have the final word. Indeed, a day is coming when injustice will be eradicated once and for all as we've just seen the the fulfillments in in Matthew chapter 2. They don't guarantee you won't experience injustice here on earth. They won't guarantee that you won't encounter some grave injustices. Ask Mary and Joseph and the parents of the Bethlehem children about that. But as another author has put it, these fulfillments are previews of coming attractions. They're previews of coming attractions. God might not resolve the injustices in this life that you're experiencing, but he certainly will in the next life. And along the way, he'll use the previews to encourage you and sustain you. Number two, Because the injustices we might experience aren't arbitrary or a challenge to God's plans, life remains worth living despite the suffering we might endure. Without God, I'm just not sure how you keep going in the face of injustice. Sure, you can devote your life to thwarting the injustices, but what if change doesn't come? In fact, what if the night seems to get even darker? I'm not sure how you keep going without God in the picture. But with God in the picture, we're reminded that his work continues, even in the face of injustice. In church, our lives are never wasted. And who knows, by the way, how God might use your injustices, the the suffering that you're experiencing to bless other people in ways unseen. Mary and Joseph, for example, were experiencing ongoing injustices at the hands of the Romans and Herod, but God was using their circumstances to set the table for Jesus' messianic ministry. We are blessed in part because of the injustices that Joseph and Mary dealt with. And then number three, 
God's well-established pattern of promise and fulfillment equips us to push back or fight against injustice without becoming vindictive. God is a justice-loving God who expects His people to act in the face of injustice. And accordingly, He's in that work and He blesses that work. Our work for justice will not be in vain. But at the same time, we're freed from vindictiveness because we're confident that God will have his way with those who act unjustly. We were just talking a moment ago about how in some ways Advent is a horrifying time for Herod's. In the cosmic scheme of things, Herod's won't be getting away with anything. And that is a promise. If there's no God to take care of things, so to speak, of of course you'll become vindictive, of course you'll take things into your own hands, because you're the only one you've got. But vindictiveness tends to rot our souls and sometimes even undermine the justice we're fighting for. And it turns out, that God's character and promises give us the best of both worlds. Hopeful zeal for pursuing justice without the awful and ugly burden of vengeance. Recognize that there are all kinds of people who are watching this, listening to this. I'm glad that that is the case. If you might be a Herod, And anyone can be a Herod at the end of the day. It is a horrifying season for Herod. but It's also a hopeful season. And my prayer for you is that you would be convicted and that you would turn to the Lord, repentance and trust. And if that describes you, we would love to have a conversation with you. We would love to show you what it means to walk with Jesus. And when you do so, you can expect that your life will change people that are perpetrating the worst kinds of injustice can, by the power of God, end up pursuing justice with self-sacrificing zeal. And if you're watching this and you're experiencing injustices, and I know that describes a lot of people in our country right now, I just want to say that our church loves you and we want to advocate for you and uh, we would love to chat with you as well. And, And I hope that this pattern of of promise and, and fulfillment that you find in Scripture is encouraging to you, even in the midst of the suffering you're enduring. Love you, City Church. Merry Christmas. To all of this I say, amen.